are going to be dealing with a number of cross-cutting issues that deals with the daily mass of the right to health under these COVID circumstances, and particularly in the context of public health. We will be more interested in looking at the relationship that exists between the right to health and public health generally in the particular context of COVID-19 in Ghana. We would also be looking at the government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in Ghana and the implications that this has for the right to health. We would look at the adequacy of the regulatory regime in Ghana on public health and policies and to see its capacity to address the challenges of COVID-19. More significantly, we will be looking for a number of pathways to find the ways for, forward. Uh, today, we have a very, very rich panel, and I'll briefly introduce them. We have Dr. Enes Usu Dapa, who is the head of Department of Commercial Law and the immediate past dean of the Faculty of Law of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Dr. Dapa has done quite some extensive work on health and health-related matters. I do remember his book on medical law in Ghana, text cases and commentaries, uh, where we never met in person, but we all met in that book when we were both struggling to find out whether the patient's charter in Ghana's Public Health Act indeed contains fundamental human rights as properly so understood. And I'll be looking forward to meeting him in person. I don't know how he resolved that dilemma. I'm still on mine now. Next would be my sister, Mrs. Elsie Hayford, who is a global health lawyer and is an adjunct assistant lecturer at the Accra College of Medicine in Accra, where she teaches medical law and ethics. She's done a lot of extensive work on health, and more particularly, she has done some work since COVID-19 on the protection of healthcare workers in terms of the legal frameworks that support emergency healthcare globally as a consultant. We will next deal with my sister, Mami Ifua Adazikum, who is a lecturer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, I think, Tech is taking a major field day today. And she teaches constitutional law and legal writings and research, which would be very handy for us in the areas of human rights in particular. And my brother, Dr. Divine Ndombi Bahubala, who is a medical legal expert, has done a number of work with the Ghana Health Service, and is now with the Medical and Dental Council. It's a medical doctor by training and also a solicitor and barrister in Ghana. He's done quite a lot of extensive work in the areas of health law and ethics. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome. I'm Benjamin Kumbo. Thank you very much. Senior and Honorable Dr. Kumbo for your kind words. So I would kickstart with Dr. Dapa. Let's make an assumption that we have a right to health in Ghana, which is still highly debated. Where that right is located can range from public uh, customary international law down to the constitution and through directive principles Whatever it is, let's make that assumption that in Ghana we have the right to help. I would want you to kickstart by giving us some context of the essential features of the right to help and how it relates to public health in particular. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumbo. And uh, I'm happy to accept the unpleasant responsibility 
of being the first person to be sent to the firing squad at the hand of uh, a venerable senior like you. Uh, <laughs> good. So uh, as uh, you rightly uh, said, as to whether we have a standalone uh, right to health or not is highly uh, debatable. Uh, however, we look at it, uh, I would suggest that uh, the right to health should be approached from a very uh, broad uh, perspective. So if you are approaching it from a very broad uh, perspective, we could probably go back to the World Health Organization Constitution and look at uh, some of the idea which goes into what health is. Talking about uh, the, uh, the highest uh, attainable standard of physical, mental, and then uh, uh, social well-being. So if you understand, if you like a right from such a broad perspective, uh, we could also uh, profit from commentary uh, number 14 by the UN uh, uh, Committee on the Constitution and Cultural Rights regarding uh, how they have explicated the, uh, the, the right uh, to health. So that gives us some, uh, uh, some ideas. So anything which, for, for example, uh, pertain to our physical well-being, to our uh, mental health being, and uh, 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 social or emotional well-being, to my view, in a very loose sense, can be considered as forming part of what constitutes a health. If that is the case, then uh, the question is this. Does it mean that anything which impinges on our physical well-being, social well-being, uh, uh, and then the mental or uh, emotional well-being can be considered as a right to health? Yes. The answer is a yes uh, and no. However, if you approach the subject from what we call like the, the duty bearer uh, uh, perspective of, uh, of health, so that if you are asserting existence of a particular uh, uh, human right, for example, like the right to health, uh, understood as the highest uh, standards of uh, physical, uh, mental, and uh, uh, social well being, then the next question is who has the, 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 the obligation? to actualize this right, or who is a duty bearer? Uh, we will quickly point to uh, the states. Yes, the state has an obligation to enable us to realize uh, uh, aspects of the, of, of the health in terms of availability, in terms of uh, access to healthcare, and also promotion and prevention of uh, anything which are uh, 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 is uh, inimical to uh, health in the sense of physical, uh, social, and uh, mental well-being. So if you look at it from that angle, in our constitution, we could say that there are a number of useful uh, uh, pointers which actually support the case that we have the, the right uh, to health. Of course, even talking about uh, uh, the right to life is an aspect of the right to health. Because if you don't have life, and ultimately, uh, what health is supposed to ensure is to not only about uh, a, cu uh, I mean, a, a curative aspect of a disease, but also protection of life, uh, treatment, and ensuring some longevity. And for that matter, anything which has to do with like the, the right to, to, to life is an aspect of the right to health. And again, anything which has to do with maybe like the torture or degrading of uh, you know, the human being is detracting from uh, health because it's detracting from the physical, uh, social, and the mental uh, 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 well-being. And again, anything which has to do with uh, giving you access to medical care, giving you access to health care, especially so when your physical, mental, and then social well-being, for example, is uh, uh, compromised in any way and you need, uh, to, you need restoration. Uh, that is also an aspect of, uh, of health. So if you want to speak in a very broad sense, I would say that the, the right to health is uh, well grounded in our constitution. But with respect to public health, uh, public health, uh, maybe let me draw just a, 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 a bit of a distinction. No, public health is looking at the, the health of the population, all of us collectively. And the, the, the right to health, especially when we look at the right to healthcare and so on, that is looking at if you like the, from the, the individual perspective. If for example, you are not well and so on and so forth, 
uh, to what extent is the state obligated to ensure that you have access, uh, the requisite facilities are available, and then you have the quality guarantee if you are to assess those things. So coming back to public health, yes, is public health uh, sufficiently reflected in our law in Ghana? The answer uh, is yes, and if for nothing at all, uh, with the recent uh, 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 pandemic, COVID-19, all of us, although we, have, we may not have necessarily studied in school, became pocket uh, experts as far as the uh, public uh, health is concerned. Uh, with the imposition of Respiration Act and people going to consider uh, Article uh, 21, uh, where mention is made that in the interest of public safety, public health, and so on, uh, some of our human rights may have to be uh, restricted. And we, so question is, the state has an uh, uh, obligation towards public health. At the same time, we also have to consider our human rights, the right to health and so on, other rights. Now, there's a tension between these two. If you want to protect public health, you are definitely going to infringe or restrict some aspect of human rights. So uh, some scholars will say that you could have what we call the, if you like, the, the forward and the backward linkage between health and public health, and then the, if you like the human rights, or you can have some kind of like symbiotic relationship because you need public health to be able to enjoy human rights. For example, if you have like a polluted air, if you have polluted water like maybe from Galamsey and so on, you drink water and you fall sick or people are just uh, smoking in the enclosed places and all that. Uh, you, we are all going to suffer as a population and this may not make it possible for us to uh, enjoy some aspect of our human rights. At the same time, you also need human rights to enjoy uh, public health. You need human rights to enjoy public health. You need, for example, uh, to have a, a mental uh, well-being. You need to have physical well-being uh, before uh, public health can also uh, be more, uh, possible. So there's that kind of, uh, if you like, the direct and indirect forward and the backward uh, linkage. That's why the fact that uh, on the face of it, uh, uh, public health and uh, human rights generally may appear to be if you like uh, a, a very uh, like rivals, or there's a serious uh, uh, tension uh, uh, between them. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me stay a bit more with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Mami, yeah, can you give us some other perspectives on the relationship between the right to health and public health? All right. From so, a human rights perspective, yes. All right. Um, so um, as Dr. Dapa already said, we have um, a constitution. Since I teach constitutional law, I like to come from the constitutional point of view. Um, about when you look at our constitution, you wouldn't find expressly the right to health, any comprehensive detailed provision on the right to health, but then you can find it in, you can have traces of it in bits and parts of the constitution. So you have, for example, when the constitution is talking about issues relating to children, and it mentions that children are, are not to be deprived from medical treatment. When the constitution is talking about the rights of the sick, and um, then it talks about the fact that your religious beliefs should not prevent you from um, being offered medical treatment because of your beliefs. And then you have, for example, when you get to, um, the, the, the ending part of chapter five, which is the importation clause and article 33, five, that talks about the fact that if there are any other rights that are necessary for a democracy to thrive and that they are not mentioned in chapter five, which is our bill of rights in Ghana, those rights can be imported. And by virtue of the fact that Ghana is a signatory to the ICCPR, and then we have also um, incorporated the World Health Organization regulations in our Public Health Act, all those um, issues relating to the right to health automatically form part of our laws. And then we also have, for example, when you go to chapter six, the directive um, principles of state policy, you have, um, you have it written that when the president is given his annual address before parliament, he's supposed to address parliament on the right to good health care. So then there's that, um, you can create that inference that there is there is some amount of right to health hanging somewhere, although may not be expressly in the document itself, but we are, there's an expectation of 
some right to health to some extent in the constitution. And then you have in the constitution itself mention of public health, like um, Dr. Lapa said, on one of the, the, the very um, provision that the imposition of restrictions act is based on, which is article 21, that once it is in the interest of public health, public safety, public protection, um, certain rights may be restricted. And so yes, they, they are interconnected, they are in, interdependent, but they are also independent on their own so that you need the right to health to be able to feed into public health, but you also at some point may have to elevate public health so that, um, certain rights to health, for example, um, as, as we see, which I think COVID-19 COVID provides a perfect scenario. So we have COVID-19 raising issues of the right to health and public health as well. But it seems as if for Ghana and for most other places, in, we, we, have, we have elevated public health a notch up than the right to health. So that even though you have a right to health outside of COVID, um, because of COVID, we, we would have to subsume your right to health in other non-COVID related cases, or even if it is COVID itself, to the community health and the public health that we have before we come to. So they are interconnected, they are interdependent, they are distinct in their own rights, but they have a connection depending on the circumstances surrounding each um, situation. Thank you. We now come to the heart of the matter. Elsie, how do we position <laughs> government responses to COVID-19 pandemic in terms of this problematic of the constitutional right to health? So I think um, to start with, we have to kind of situate Ghana within the global context and all the agreements that we have, uh, we are signatories to. So for instance, if you look at the WHO, it has three binding instruments. And the first one is the WHO constitution itself, the framework convention to, uh, on tobacco control, and then there's the international health regulations. Now, interestingly, we have the framework convention on tobacco control and the inter international health regulations, which specifically concern COVID-19 and other infectious diseases transplanted verbatim into our public health act. So in a sense, just by those actions, we, we have um, assented to that right to health because again, it's within the WHO constitution, which we are also bound by. Also, if we come to the regional level, uh, article 16.2 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights also places a greater duty on member states to take necessary measures to protect the health of their populations. And then it goes further to say that in doing so, they should also ensure that people receive medical attention. Now, if we look at the international health regulations, which is key when we talk about COVID-19, um, sure, that is an instrument that essentially balances a number of rights. So first of all, um, you have um, one key factor, which is the adherence to scientific methodologies, which is extremely important because you're talking about um, things like surveillance and reporting and data collection. And of course, with that comes um, data processing and protection and how we go about all that anonymization. And then also you have um, uh, uh, and travel, travel and, and also transportation, how all that works when you have a, a pandemic. And then of course, human rights. And so in a sense, we, the, it's obvious that the will is there to, to, to do the things that are necessary to ensure that A, human rights are respected and also that there's regard for travel and trade that needs to happen even during a pandemic. And then of course, um, the scientific side as well is also um, there, um, but I guess further on in the conversation, we'll look at whatever gaps that exist. But I would say from my perspective that the, the will to ensure that um, the international obligations we have are, are adhered to is there and is very obvious from the instruments that we have at the moment. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ba Yubala. 
we are now getting into the institutional arena. And uh, you coming from that river would want you to throw some more light actually on how our Ghanaian institutions, health, public health institutions, are addressing this rather delicate balance between the constitutional right to health in the practice of public health under COVID. Thank you very much. And very exciting perspective by my, my well-considered uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, a number of things. Um, it's often said that it's, it's only lay persons who know what health is. The health experts don't know. And therefore, forgive my ignorance. But just for the purposes of refocusing so that people can follow. When you are dealing with public health, and we are talking about a right to health. Whilst we agree that medicine saves lives, we must be cognizant of, of the fact that medicine cannot save society. Therefore, we need to constrain this in three dimensions. The first one is healthcare itself which deals with clinical services and related matters with or without a public health emergency like COVID. Then the second level is to deal with what we call public health, which deals with the health as it relates to populations. And uh, I must say this because when Ernest started, he gave a fantastic rendition of the three key considerations of the WHO's definition of health. The third component has to deal with the socioeconomic aspects. So for example, it is arguable that it will be an overly enthusiastic state that will assume a duty to me not to be jilted by my girlfriend or my wife. Because once you're jilted, are you psychologically, mentally healthy? So that is why the conversations of health on right to health are debatable. So within this context, we are looking at health in terms of public health and healthcare services. Because the other determinants, be they cultural, religious, social, economic, are largely outside any single ministry of health and East related agencies in any country in the world. Now at the level of the institutions, what COVID exposed is our lack of preparedness and our capacity to respond to an evolving, emerging, new threat to a population's health. And to make matters worse, it becomes a public health event of international concern when it is not just an endemic event, but a pandemic. And that is where the perspective of Elsie and her expertise in this matter it is, is actually up. So from the institutional level, and I'll just give the response so that maybe Ghanaians who were following will understand why the response was structured in that manner. You really need to look at key actors and the key institutions that you need given these three dimensions of what will count as health. So you look at the national government and its primary role is to ensure that it has resilience health systems including research systems. Because one of the key functions is that research in an emergency, health-related research in an emergency, a health emergency, is actually an important component of disaster preparedness, response, and mitigation. Because it helps us to refocus scarce limited resources in the direction where the science leads us. So you find that it's an evolving situation, new knowledge is emerging. The, other component is to look at intergovernmental agencies or departments so that 
we are finding district assemblies, we are finding other ministries with their issues of sanitation coming in, we have issues of housing and all that. And all of these departments, ministries, departments and agencies are acting in concert to support the national overall strategic direction. Then at the third level is that you need in these kind of situations from an institutional perspective to look at the humanitarian sector where you bring in other actors like non-governmental organizations. So you'll find that in our response, the NGOs in health in particular and other related bodies were an integral part of the considerations. Then in our setting, because it is an international public health event or in a public health event of international concern, in accordance with the expectations of the International Health Regulations of 2005, we had to deal with the development partners who will provide funding, provide technical support, and you will find that the development partners, the WHO and others worked in concert with central government, with the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service and related agencies to provide a response. And the ingredient there is the actual value of peer learning from other settings as to what is working and what is not working. Then at the next level is mobilization of a critical component of our uh, you know, uh, uh, people, our resources, which is normally not seen, which is the security services. And you may deploy them in a number of ways, including the military and other agencies, because you may activate their logistical, maybe you need support in terms of logistics, in terms of deployment, or in terms of technical support. And these are critical, very critical state agencies. And of course, in enforcement of rules and regulations to protect the, the general population's health. And so you will find that the presidential emergency instruments and related uh, you know, regulations needed enforcement and we needed to have that. And that is also because uh, in a liberal democracy with any commitment to the million conception of the harm principle warranting action, it is obvious that sometimes persons may even know that which is in their best interest, but may not be predisposed to taking the right actions. So an enforcement is a key component of that. Then you need to you know, pick a key resource in our context, the private sector, from an institutional perspective, so that the private sector then works with the various departments, ministries, departments, and agencies to leverage on expertise and then make sure that we maximize cost effect, uh, effectiveness and efficiency, including funding. And for us, we have a model where the Ghan East you know, uh, Infectious Disease Hospital was set up with effective collaboration and coordination between the private sector, the ministries, departments, and agencies, and the security to ensure that we deliver this world-class center within four weeks, unprecedented. So from um, an institutional perspective, uh, and also from a professional regulatory perspective, remember that because it is a health emergency, it is the healthcare professionals who will be at the forefront of it. And we regulate the doctors, dentists, and physician assistants who are the frontline professionals. But in a situation where you have less than ideal conditions, people have to make decisions under pressurized time constrained conditions where there are uncertainties. And remember we have carers, we have healers, we, we do not have saints. They have their own uncertainties, concerns, fears. And therefore it wasn't surprising that we had professional associations, one in particular, which I will not name, indicating that professionals who were not, for example, sufficiently provided with logistics and equipment to work could remove themselves from care environment. So to just to say that it is important that as institutions, we are therefore minded, whether directly or indirectly, ensuring that whatever action we take in emergencies, those actions are reasonable, proportionate, 
they are fair to all the persons because we are dealing with people at the most vulnerable states of our existence. And for that matter, it is important to provide guidance and support to these individuals who are going to be making those decisions at, on the spur of the moment so that they, these actions can then be human rights affirming. And that is why I thought that the seminar was apt and whoever put it together actually did a fantastic job because it is still all entirely possible that in this messy, stress-filled environment where we have a great deal need, human need, in the face of this kind of emergency, we can still have derogation from right in a way that it is fair, that is warranted, and that is proportionate and reasonable. And of course, above all, it must be transparent and accountable to ensure that we do not use the excuse of a public health emergency to take away what we all agree, no matter how blurry the boundaries may be, that there appear to be concrete rise to health, one way or the other. So I will uh, leave my initial submissions here. Thank you, Dr. Devine. This now brings us again to, to, to the more interesting aspect, which I think Dr. Wusu Dapa can throw some light on. Firstly, this challenge of the interface or uh, between public health issue regulation in times of an emergency and respect for fundamental human rights and freedoms. I just give one illustration. In the constitution, we are supposed to have a right to work under safe and healthy conditions. So will a health worker legitimately refuse to work in an unsafe and an unhealthy environment within the context of COVID-19. This is where the dilemma actually comes. Can the person invoke the article to work under safe and healthy conditions as a basis not to carry out in an unprotected clinical environment of COVID-19 work? Uh, thank you, uh, Doc, and moderator. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, help us to appreciate that when we talk about public health, it is one of the fundamental philosophical justification for existence of the state. And it is it's somehow akin to aspect of the social contract theory. The reason being that when it comes to uh, the right to health, we are talking about more or less like you, the individual. But public health, nobody, no matter how rich you are, can you provide it for yourself. Public health has to do with the collective, the, the uh, 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 aggregation of various uh, efforts. So no single individual can uh, guarantee public health for himself or herself. And that is why you need the state, which is endowed also with the coercive power so that as and when necessary, it can impose standards which are meant to ensure that uh, public health is safeguarded against certain risks and more so in emergencies. So you have the tension between what we call the individual autonomy, autonomy of the individual in the normal times and also the need to safeguard the, the, the population from existential threats. And the pandemic COVID-19 that we have is a, a clear uh, example. Yes, uh, when the, the, the COVID-19 uh, erupted, uh, with the assistance of the technical team, we have had the benefit of what we call like the protocols uh, for managing it. So coming back to, let's say, the specific scenario that you interestingly provoke, if, for example, an employee should go to like the, the, the workspace and the protocols for managing, let's say, COVID-19 uh, are not there, will it be legitimate for the employee, for example, to refuse to work? And could the employer 
terminate the appointment. And if the employee terminated the appointment, let's say we come back to the Labor Act, could you, for example, invoke issues like unfair termination uh, and things like that? I mean, these are very uh, uh, legitimate uh, possibilities, uh, which uh, will have to be explored. And I dare uh, say that insofar as we have uh, a legislation which is meant to help us to fight uh, this particular uh, pandemic. And I must also add that when it comes to public health, uh, the scholars uh, rightly let us understand that it is highly positivistic. And I want to underline positivistic. That is to say that in public health, you need to enact laws, you need to enact policies. It's not something that you can just uh, leave it hanging. And for that matter, public health does not try well on, if you like, open tested type of legislation, which allow for rooms of a lot of uh, subjectivity. So you need uh, a positivistic normative standards to enable you uh, police public health. Because human beings, we have said that, Yes, just as we are all afraid to die or to become uh, seriously impaired in one way, we have weak will. And left to us alone, the very things which we are supposed to avoid or which we are supposed to do, so as to safeguard our collective health, we may fail to do that. So you need the state to come in and use its coercive power, which we, by virtue of uh, accepting to have the state, to surrender some of our uh, individual rights in the interest of the, 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 the common good, the common good, uh, uh, this contest being the, our, uh, our existence, the collective, that we need, we need to avoid anything which will lead to our extension or extermination. And if that is the case, then we need to cooperate. And the cooperation will have to be managed by the state. And that is why we have a various legislation. But my concern with the you know, COVID-19 is that, and I look at the MAMI, uh, if you a, a reflection on the imposition of COVID-19 uh, legislation, that you see, the problem we have in our country is that two things, either we don't care about finding out the laws that you have in our country, or you think, we think that if you have the law, the law in itself will be a panacea to the problem we are trying to deal with. Public health is one of the areas in our country which we have known and dealt with as far as the colonial time. We can go back to uh, 1907. We had the mosquitoes ordinance. We had the various infectious legislation. And if you look at the Public Health Act of 2012 at 851, if you look at the repeal uh, provisions, uh, all these uh, things I'm talking about are there. And if, if we read, I was teaching veterinary medicine, so I had the opportunity to do a bit of research in this area. And I was amazed about public health enactment that uh, we've had. Going back to over uh, maybe like 100 uh, years uh, before we even came to have our, our modern uh, Republic of Ghana. And most of the things there can be harnessed effectively to deal with the modern uh, uh, you know, uh, manifestations of public health challenge that we are getting. But because we don't look at our law, even, even in school, if you look at our education, you'll be like the law school, how many lawyers? If not because maybe like you, get the, you get the case and you are pushed to go and do some research, how many lawyers, if you are to conduct a general survey, are even abreast with the rich normative standards we have with respect to public health before we even came to have the Public Health Act. And I think that if you look at the, the current uh, problem that we have, the imposition of the Restrictions uh, you know, Act, yes, although uh, there's nothing wrong in re uh, enforcing uh, that which exists already, but I think that if we're very much abreast and we're you know, engaging the laws that we have, we could have effectively, we could have effectively have enough uh, legislative backing to enable us to deal with this problem without even witnessing the kind of uh, uh, political uh, banter we had between the various political actors when it came to uh, adoption of this particular law. So that is the, the, the main problem. And not until, uh, uh, you know, Dr. 
divine says something, and then what I am making from it and consistent with what pertains to the literature is that we need cooperation. We need education. Public health can be safeguarded when we have cooperation. And also, we also need like education. Education in the sense that we need to know about what exists in our law regarding public health. Uh, LC talk about the, uh, the more or less verbatim incorporation of the World Health um, Tobacco Framework and International Health uh, Regulations per our uh, Public Health Act in our law. But you ask yourself, if probably not for some of the limited uh, interest some of them have, how many people in Ghana are aware of this? And what efforts are made by the NCC? What efforts are made by the Ghana Health Education? What efforts are made by even lawyers? to help all of us, including policymakers and implementers, to become abreast with what we have already. And not until we do that, we will always be reinventing the wheel. The wheel has already been uh, invented, and there's no, uh, there's no need uh, uh, to do that. And the imposition of the Restoration Act is a, a typical example of uh, our failure to even become aware of the married and the plethora of legislative framework that we have in relation to uh, public health. And that is why we are running a health task shelter to push our lawmakers to make a law when it was more or less uh, not necessary. And uh, our executive had enough, enough legislative machinery to be able to effectively uh, uh, lead us uh, in fighting uh, this uh, uh, pandemic without even the need of any new uh, legislation. And then finally, the cooperation. If you look at our constitution, Article 31, for example, uh, Dr. Divine mentioned about what call the no harm uh, principle of uh, G.S. Mills. If you look at our constitution, we have an obligation as individuals to avoid doing anything which will affect the welfare of others. So we have what we call the obligation to avoid uh, harm to others. And for that matter, uh, where you are going to indulge in certain behavioral patterns, which are going to uh, be harmful to the population, and you have uh, a public uh, health legislation or policy, which says that you shouldn't do that. Now, you shouldn't understand that as being uh, an infringement on your human right, because first of all, uh, you have an obligation under the constitution to avoid behaviors which will cause harm to others. But then because of the, uh, uh, what we know about the susceptibility or propensity of the executive to always go uh, 10 miles when you give them a one each with respect to imposing uh, restriction on liberties of the citizen, there's a need uh, for proportionality, meaning that if you have a less, if you like the liberty infringing or less uh, liberty disruptive uh, public health measure, you have to go for that and avoid that, which will be out of balance. Otherwise, if you go for one which is really disproportionate, then you are just trying to uh, uh, take the human rights of your citizen for granted in the name of uh, fighting a uh, 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 public uh, health uh, uh, crisis. Yeah, thank you. Mami, the matter gets more complicated and more complicated. Let's just zero down on the imposition of restrictions at, in the light of COVID-19. I, I, I must be honest with you, I'll be asking a question that I myself have a challenge with what is the answer. Mm -hmm. What is it seeking to regulate? or what is it seeking to advance? Does it seek to advance public health or does it seek to curtail human rights with a view to advancing public health? Or are there emergency legislation designed to deal with an emergency situation without sunset clauses? All right. So from the IRA itself, it draws its um, authority from article 21 um, for clause four and um, paragraph C and D of the constitution, which um, that provision allows the limitation of um, 
human rights um, in the interest of public safety, public health, and public protection. And that's where the IRA draws its um, authority from. Um, but from the way the IRA is put, it has, which, which shouldn't have been a problem or shouldn't be a problem, but in, a, in, a, in the research that I did, I found, I'll say maybe two main issues with it, that first of all, that very article from which it draws its source from is debatable because that limitation is meant to be used in normal times and not in emergency times. And so you have um, an act that is um, issuing out emergency powers or emergency directives, but drawing its authority from an article that is intended to be used during normal times, normal, not when there's an emergency like COVID, whether a public health emergency or any other form of emergency like a natural disaster or whatever it may be. Then the second um, issue that I have with it, like you mentioned, is the fact that it doesn't have a sunset clause. It doesn't mention COVID-19 anywhere. And um, when I was reading the parliamentary debate that led to leading to the adoption of the, the act, um, there were concerns about including um, COVID-19 somewhere in the act so that it's limited to the pandemic, even if it doesn't have a sunset clause, so that it's, it may automatically die out with the pandemic when, when everything blows over. But the Attorney General's argument was that the, the, the act is intended to live beyond the pandemic so that in any other emergency that may come up, we would have some um, instruments some legislative device already in existence to handle it, which comes back to what um, the issue that Dr. Dapa raised about um, our awareness of what already exists, because we keep um, repeating the same things in different forms. And so you have multiplicity of options. And so at any point in time, when we have any issue, you, you have the person who has to, who has to call the, the shots deciding which one favors him or her. So you have um, presidents, the current president going for the IRA, who knows who the next person who comes would want to. If they look at the options available to them, anything, the IRA that we are even um, debating on is not sufficient for him or her, then he would also go on to, to, to bring up another law in the future on another thing. So that's basically what the IRA intended to set out to do. But um, like you have said, it places us at, at a very great disadvantage considering where we are coming from as a country, considering our history and considering um, who the act may, whose hands the, ha the act may land in the future. And if that person be is a tyrant or a dictator, we, we, are, we are headed for doom. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Is it a situation that the mosquito has been wanting to go to the in-law's house and the wind is blowing in that direction? <laughs> to the extent that we just are passing a law and making sure that that law is not for the new normal, but can even be invoked and used when normalcy returns. Yet law and emergencies have been conceptually grounded that in exceptional circumstances, you normally will come with this legislation with the anticipation that it is temporary. And that should the exceptional circumstances abate, the law too should abate. But this is the context in which you have explained it. And Elsie, Let's now use our global best practices and standards with a collection of almost all this regulatory and policy framework within COVID-19 in terms of public health. Are they adequate enough to address our challenge? Hmm, I would say yes and no. Uh, because at the moment, the way our laws are set up, there's a, there's a lot of silos. And so there are laws in different places covering different issues. And so from where I sit, I think what will be most expedient um, to consider going forward is to have an overarching health legislation that brings together all the regulatory functions under that act, also brings together aspects of um, healthcare itself and gives legit legitimacy um, or reiterates the existing legislation we have already so that when we have uh, emergencies like this or any other um, events for that matter, 
we can go straight there and, and that gives direction to what should be done so that we don't have this issue of you know new laws being set up willy-nilly um, just because something has happened and then we don't have knee-jerk knee reactions to situations that really we should have preempted and had a, a well thought through process for. Um, so in that respect, I think that the, the, the host of gaps that, that we need to ensure that are covered. So for instance, if you want a fully comprehensive public health law that really um, speaks to the issue, any issues that can arise, first of all, the act should be written in a way that is broad enough for you to be able to to, to implement when the time comes. And then you have to clearly define triggering events, broadly define what public health events are, and it must also include food and animal and related diseases. So this idea of a one health approach where you're, you're bringing in the veterinary side, you're bringing in the environment, you're bringing in um, also um, plants, uh, health as well, because all these things are areas from which um, public health events could emanate. And then always it's important as well for um, a public health act that is fit for purpose to also have um, sort of an open-ended list of unexpected, which will allow for unexpected events to be catered for. And then of course we need strong and agile decision-making with proper oversight. And so in my suggestion of having an overarching legislation, for instance, this act would be one that would tell us clearly where the lines of authority lie and, and when do they kick in and how long for. So this issue that uh, uh, Mamefa was talking about in terms of the sunset clause for the restriction and it restrictions imposition of restrictions act will not arise because then you know that it's only temporary in nature and for a specific time, and therefore you don't have um, powers being used outside of, 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 of context. And then of course, we need to look at our obligations under the IHR and see when we need to notify um, the WHO is the uh, national IHR focal points, is it well established? How does it work? Does this overarching legislation give legitimacy to it as well? Um, are human rights protected? Uh, is it guaranteed that the rights there are non-derogable and are there procedures in place to also protect other rights? So there are a host of things that we should be looking at in that regard. And I want to add a small point to what Dr. Divine and Dr. Dapa were, were talking about earlier on the issue of um, whether health professionals can, can decide not to work. So we, we know that our Labour Act actually, I think from sections eight down, talks about duties of employers and employees. But then I think what is also fundamentally missing is we have um, a national infection prevention and control uh, policy. However, I don't know how much of that has been in the picture in the midst of all this. So, um, so much so that it's, it also puts, it also mentions duties that facilities have to their employees in the event of an emergency. So if we take, for instance, um, a country like Taiwan who have handled COVID-19 excellently, they even have went as far as putting in place an infection prevention control law, which is given effect by their public health act. So in that case, every facility that has um, more than 150 beds needed to have an IPC policy internally, and they needed to have clear lines of authority saying what should happen, when can doctors decide or nurses or other health professionals decide that they are not able to work. Because essentially, if, if the health professional is not protected, it also increases the risk of hospital acquired infections. So these are all things that um, we really need to, need to sit down and look at all the pieces of legislation and policy we have within our, our legal framework and decide which ones to maybe do away with and which ones to highlight so that we don't um, have to keep reinventing the wheel.
Yes, thank you very much. Dr. Divine, let's come closer home to you and me, our practice area in law and development. Ghana, like all other emerging economies, we just want to let people feel good with law. When you have a problem, pass a law and the problem vanishes. More law, more development. In the context of COVID-19, is, is it that there is an absence of a law regime to address the pandemic or perhaps too many law regimes that are tripping over each other that is even making the realization of the right to health difficult? How, how do you see this from the institutional perspective? Thank you very much. Uh, and I've been listening keenly. A number of things. Um, the interest here is that uh, I was instrumental in putting together our Public Health Act. In fact, I had consultancy award from the WHO to support the development of public health laws based upon the model and the strategy we adopted in Ghana. So I will get to your question, but I'll answer your first question that you um, addressed, and I'm not sure that it was sufficiently uh, answered in respect of healthcare professionals and in the face of inadequacy um, of uh, logistics, supplies, and other things, whether or not they could discontinue their social contract with the rest of us. Now, a number of points. The fact that I have done the wrong thing. It's not sufficient grounds for you to do, to refuse to do the right thing. Two, there is a difference between the legal duty of care. And here I'm going professionally and ethically. And the professional responsibility to treat. And often we get people, this is a very nuanced conversation. And sometimes we get people who are not sufficiently informed running to the labor act to the point. First of all, the profession has its own norms and values. And they are, as professional regulators, we are, we are interested in only three things. Do our professionals possess the technical competence necessary to be able to provide the protection that they need? Two, do they have the right conduct? And three, are they exercising their competence and conducts in accordance with established professional ethics? So it is professionally unacceptable, ethically unjustifiable for a doctor to say that I don't have sufficient PPE and therefore I'm going home. We must understand that the state has a duty bearer. And that is why I, I want to support NS. And I started off my conversation by saying that for any meaningful conversation on public health in particular, for any meaningful normative analysis, it has to be rooted in political theory. Because it's a political process and the distribution of resources. And one of the things I, I I've always said is that of all the many certainties in the world, there are two that I will never forget. The first one is that once you are alive, you die. Death is a certainty. The second one is that, the second one is that there will never be enough resources. That is why, particularly in an emergency situation, we expect institutions not to presume that their professionals are saints and they will automatically know what to do. So was it, is it about law? There are two, I'll go jurisprudential just for a minute, then I'll get down to answer the specific question. You may deploy law, the role of law in any enterprise and in specific terms in our health and public health context may be deployed in two forms. The role of law as a facilitator 
of an expression of specific norms and values, aspirations of a society, and then the role of law as an empire. So when you find enforcement and all that, you are activating the role of law. So law is not a panacea. In fact, more law breeds more confusion. Then you run into conflict of laws and then it stifles efficiency. So one of the primary objects of the 2012 Public Health Act at 851 was to pool our ordinances that dealt with veterinary, that dealt with environmental sanitation are in silos together under one framework. And knowing that public health is not only endemic or local, but has capacity for international cross-border actions, we decided that we should incorporate the two instruments that Elsie referred to, the WH Convention on Tobacco and the International Health Regulations of 2005. In fact, we actually asked for an extension to be able to make sure we brought our Public Health Act in line with that. If you look in the Public Health Act, it provides a clear pathway that when there's a public health event of international concern or local concern, the minister has powers to issue executive instruments. So, and that is feeds back to what Mami Efwa, uh, 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 you know, her analysis showed. And therefore, it was actually, we had sufficient grounds in terms of laws already written as reflected in our Public Health Act. I think section 169 thereof. And I know that the human rights, the patient's charter, which are the rights to healthcare, are attaching, uh, we attached it as schedule six in under section 167, if I recall correct, correct, correctly. And then the international health regulations attached as section and uh, schedule seven under section 169, uh, six, eight. So all of these are already there. And therefore, it was just for the minister to activate the requirements of the law. So it is not about uh, maybe our problem was insufficient awareness of the resources available to us to be able to act in a much more timeless manner and marshal all the forces. And if you check, all the things that you are talking about are provided for in this Public Health Act. So from an institutional perspective, I think what we have been missing is education and awareness creation. Two, interagency and interministerial coordination. And three, the lack of guidance to practitioners, professionals, and various departments of their obligations and the opportunities for us to be able to leverage on the laws, the regulations, and the rules, and practice guidance. For example, we recognize that right away, a practitioner who is going to see a COVID patient. When the thing happened, I had colleagues who had to stay away from their family because they had a public obligation to protect all of us, our health. But we have people who have to make decisions that there are two ventilators, but I have five patients. If all shall die, whom shall I save? Now, these very weighty decisions have been exercised by persons who are so human, not sins, and they require support and they wreak a lot of psychological harm. And if you don't take time, it demoralizes the workforce. And therefore you have the escapism that we are seeing by saying that I don't have enough logistics, I don't have enough, there will never be enough. There is a moral obligation as practitioners that even within those conditions, how do I ration and ration in a way that is fair 
and that is professionally acceptable, that is ethical, and that is legally not problematic. And I think that from the institutional perspective, it is about professional regulators, Medical and Dental Council leading the charge. One of the shortfalls, the gaps we recognize is that we do not have specific guidance step by step in terms of public health physicians, if there's a public health emergency and there are issues about the liberation of rights, be they medical confidentiality and privacy issues, because one of the key mantra was enhanced contact tracing, early identification, isolate, treat, and you contain. Now, practitioner, in the public health, I need to identify. So if I want to identify what happens to the ethical legal obligation of medical privacy and confidentiality, and how do I ex do it in a way that is warranted to start with, and if it's warranted that it is fair, and that if it's fair that it is proportionate. So who should I disclose to? These are the issues, and there are huge gaps there because we do not have guidance either for the public health physicians, for those providing clinical services, or for those having to make the difficult decisions of deciding between lives when the resources are scarce. And within a resource constrained environment and country like ours, those kind of pressures become even more difficult. So straight away, the issue is not about more laws because Often lawyers, we know that law does not solve every problem. But now lawyers think that if there's law, then the problem is solved. But in the specific context of emergency preparedness and response, I submit without any doubt that the public, current Public Health Act in its current position was more than adequate to be able to provide a coordinated response even at the level of the minister. But remember, just to make this point, because we may have non-technical audience, one part of public health response is information gathering. So if you find that there is a requirement of the Imposition of Restrictions Act 2012 to gather information, it's an because the role of technology in health service delivery, public health response, and indeed in clinical service delivery has enough commentary. And I must say that, so the requirements, even though the, the act did not mention COVID, which it was supposed to be dealing with, I think that is curious, but the requirement of information, if it was for a public health emergency, may be something that may be warranted, may be something that may be fair, and may be something that was supposed to be transparently and accountably done in a proportionate manner, exercised in accordance with careful considerations to the ethical, legal, and public health implications that we need that information for. So if you need to locate people by contact tracing, and to track you by GPS system, and we collect that data, then, I mean, th that is something that in terms of our principle, and if you check in our local context, and it is important that we, we should not have difficulty, right from the community level, sub-district, district, regional and national level, or of responding, and you'll find that Africa appeared to do better with minimal resources in this response. That is because our, Architecture is founded on a communitarian ethos and the pinned by the principle of collective solidarity. So it is not surprising that even in the rights ascribed to us in chapter five, you will find the, the right to communal labor as is normally expected. So once you have that setting, it becomes obvious that we, we have committed ourselves to a liberal million conception. And we agree that the state has to responsibly balance when it can allow individuals of that community to 
how much harm will they allow individual members to share that harm to other members of the community? And at what point should there be some restriction? And what should be the guiding principles if those restrictions are supposed to be made? So uh, I submit that our Public Health Act was more than adequate for us to respond effectively, efficiently, timelessly to the COVID-19 pandemic. But I have no doubt that it is a matter of maybe political will. Remember, I said any analysis of public health, meaningful normative analysis will be insufficient if it is not rooted in political theory. So in public health responses, don't let us limit it to healthcare or public health, but remember the socioeconomic dimension. And therefore, the president may have come in to try to elevate it to that level and give it that kind of political will, we can, we can debate that maybe the minister could have exercised it and he could have come in in a different form. But that is about style. But in terms of substance, I think that the laws we had would have proved adequate. What is inadequate is our preparedness, institutional capacities, and resources. In fact, and capacities in terms of human resource. For example, in fact, we made a it was open secret that even if we had dropped 1,000 ventilators in this country, we would not have sufficiently skilled emergency physicians and anesthetists to be able to run them. So these are the conversations and the gaps that we are addressing our minds to. So at the core of it is for professional regulators in terms of the regulatory component, human rights affirming approaches would be for us to move the step ahead and use our enabling registration, which is the Health Professions Regulatory Bodies Act of 2013, Act 857, and make sure that we begin to provide content because one of our shared values is to guide the professions and protect the public. And if you don't provide the guidance, then what you leave the public unprotected in terms of their rights being you know, taken away from them. And therefore, for us to have a humane, responsive healthcare delivery system that meets our needs as a people with human rights at its core, it means that as professional regulators like us, we need to move the processes forward by providing ethical and the legal guidance step-by-step step to professionals when they are making this kind of very difficult uh, decisions. Thank you. Dr. Devine has gotten us to our last main topic, which is the way forward. And he has already launched and given us some perspectives on the way forward in terms of the institutional and regulatory framework. So we can go back starting with Dr. Usu Dapa. What is the way forward? Is there any need for legal reform at all? If so, in which specific areas? Dr. Usu, Papa, then Mami, then Elsie, and then we will end with Dr. Divine. And then we open up to get questions and answers. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Ennis. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself. I just I didn't know how. Yeah. So thank you very much. I share uh, all the, the views that the, Dr. Divine um, has expressed. Well, with respect to legal reform, I would say that there's no need for legal reform. We have enough, we have adequate legal framework to enable us to deal with a uh, public health uh, issue. I would rather suggest that we need to be more careful about resource allocation with respect to uh, public health. And I'll go back to our uh, medical education. Uh, as a country, we seem to have given uh, disproportionate uh, attention to healthcare provision so that uh, those who provide medical care when we are sick, in terms of their education and all that, they have received more attention from our policymakers and those who are in charge of our resources than 
uh, those who are supposed to manage uh, bigger issues so that you don't even fall sick or should unexpected uh, 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 you know, public health crisis should uh, erupt, how we'll be able to contain it so that we minimize the risk. Dr. Devine talk about certain certainties, talk about death and all that. I also say that another certainty is about a public health crisis. So long as we remain a human society, we cannot say with certainty that the next 10 or 20 years, we are not going to have any public health crisis. We can even have more, uh, more serious than the COVID-19 that uh, we are having. If that is the case, what it means is that we need to be more proactive in how we build capacity of professionals who are supposed to uh, lead us should we have that crisis. And I'll go back to our medical schools. Let us ask ourselves uh, uh, the, the amount of support we give to those who do public health. So we need to do more about our public health uh, education. We should resource sufficiently how we resource our, uh, our normal uh, medical education, those who are doing medicine and dentistry. We should uh, resource uh, public health uh, 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 students and uh, researchers. And again, when it comes to public uh, health crisis, there's also the need for what we call social justice. The reason being that citizens or population are affected differently. We have uh, some who are more vulnerable, who are more disadvantageous, and they will need to be given more support. And that is why I could not agree more with Dr. Divan when you talk about the, what do you call like the, the solidarity, collective solidarity. Solidarity here will mean that, for example, the COVID-19 Positional Restrictions Act, there are some people, if they don't even come out, they will not even get their daily meal. So such people are, for example, going to be affected more than uh, some of us who uh, could, for example, live in their room and still earn our incomes and so on. So as a society, uh, how much uh, support are we giving to those who are going to be more affected in the event of a public health crisis? So the social justice uh, aspect of public health management is very important. If you look at our laws as we have now, uh, in terms of the, the, the enablement, legal enablement, I think uh, we are not being bad. And I agree perfectly that the Public Health Act of uh, 2012 at 851 uh, is uh, sufficiently uh, robust and can enable us to deal with any public health uh, uh, crisis. And I would also like to emphasize what you call the intersectorial uh, collaboration, because public health is not just a matter for Ministry of Health. Public health has got implication for all sectors of our society. It's got implication for uh, Ministry of Transport. Uh, it's got implication uh, for agriculture. It got implication for so many others. But before uh, I leave, I will suggest that we have a, a more serious uh, public health crisis, even than the COVID-19, which we have ignored. And that has to do with something which is emanating from the uh, safety of uh, herbal beverages and also food standards. If you look at the Public Health Act, we are supposed to have uh, the Food uh, and Drugs Authority uh, doing very serious uh, work in terms of ensuring that uh, things which are put on our market for human consumption and all that are reasonably safe. Uh, Dr. Devan, he is a medical doctor in addition to being a, a lawyer medical legal expert. He will bear me out that one, major public health crisis, which we are going to see is what we are going to have like the, the, the kidney and other uh, uh, CVD uh, diseases as a result of very uh, dangerous uh, 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 components, which are being added to various beverages and the media uh, is used aggressively to market them and nothing is being done. So we are sitting on a, a time bomb. It will get to a time that we are going to have so many people who will need uh, dialysis and some other uh, things. And these are all uh, public health uh, uh, matters. And we don't have to wait until they become uh, uh, a pandemic or until they assume a scale, like the scale that uh, we are witnessing. So uh, in terms of law, as I have said uh, before, I would say that there's no need for uh, legal reform. Uh, we need to keep the laws as we have because like more uh, legislation does not guarantee uh, immediate solution. But we need to be aware of what we have. And we also need, we don't test our laws soon enough. And I think that we 
as lawyers and teachers are also to be blamed. For example, you ask the question about uh, if someone uh, says that I will not go to work because uh, my employer has not put in place the necessary uh, PP or the protocols, uh, whether the employer could, for example, fire the employee and so on and so forth. I mean, these are very interesting things. And I'm sure some have come up, but we don't see these matters being uh, litigated or being taken to the Medical and Dental Council, uh, Dr. Devine's uh, outfit, so that we get uh, some uh, reflections on how some of these uh, normative standards in our various law uh, play out in actual or uh, uh, practical uh, contests. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you. We just have five more minutes to go or so. So, Mami, quickly, Elsie, and then Dr. Devine will wrap up. Then we take questions from the public. All right. So, I think, as has already been said, going forward, we have um, enough laws. We do not need to add in more laws. And within the laws, we also have um, pathways that lead to sub supplementary additions so that even though we have the Public Health Act, there's room for an EI if it is necessary. There's room for an LI if it is necessary so that these things flow and supplement what is missing in the Public Health Act, for example. And in my readings, what one of the things I, ca I came across is, for example, be because um, the pandemic deals with um, isolation and quarantine, um, there, there might be a need for a more standardized um, coordination of how quarantine should go. I mean, in terms of in paperwork, are there any orders that must come? Are there any forms that must be filled, you know, to, to properly, like he was saying, it's part of getting the health professionals know what to do and how to go about things so that everybody understands what, what the system is. Everybody understands how the system works. Everybody knows how everything should go. So yes, the laws are enough. We just need to use wh what we have in the law, the instruments we have available in the law to work out around the situations that we, we have. Okay, so I would, um, I'll, I'll probably be the, the, the lone voice among the pack, but um, and that's also okay. Um, I want to do, draw attention to one thing, and I think that's, that's what I was trying to elucidate in my earlier point. So the uniqueness of COVID-19 was that it was a disease that actually brought together both communicable and non-communicable diseases. So we heard earlier on that, you know, people with underlying conditions um, were at most risk. And then also they were more susceptible to death and all that. And so really what I was getting at was that um, we should look at the whole of the sector, not necessarily just um, public health, in the public health act in responding to public health because as we've rightly said, as Dr. Dapa said, also Dr. Divine said, um, and Mami Efua also made mention of this in, from a different perspective. It is, it is very obvious that we need all sectors of government to play a role. And so in, in saying that perhaps we need an overarching legislation, I'm talking about bringing both um, primary health care services, the public health aspects as well, under one umbrella so that it's very easy to see where to go next. But then also it's key as well that all the provisions within the Public Health Act that actually require regulations to be made or require executive instruments, of course, those should be implemented as well. I think that regulations would also help to bring clarity to some of the areas that um, people may not necessarily be aware of. And um, so, for instance, I think it would be useful if we had um, a strategy that dis defines the implementation structures and rules and responsibilities of all the organizations that would come into play in the event of a public health emergency. And um, I remember that early on in this conversation, we talked about different, um, I, I think when Dr. Devine answered the question on institutional capacity and um, the word multiplicity of institutions that came together to make things happen. So perhaps if we have a formal document of some sorts that, that talks about this process, that would also be helpful. And then um, in the event of any, any emergencies, those can be drawn on. Also, I came across um, a national health policy, which I believe was passed in January, 2020 last year. If we look at that, we see that 
um, the, the, the government and all the health actors that were involved with putting that together. They're talking about moving towards universal health coverage and also emergency preparedness. It has some excellent recommendations and policy objectives about the way forward. So if we're able to follow that process and really um, do the education we need to do within um, the professionals, also within the public, I think that we will go a very long way. Ghana has already um, been exemplary in its dealings with, um, or in its response to COVID-19. So I think if we follow that trajectory, we will certainly be a, a beaming example for all the world to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devine. Briefly, Briefly, I was anticipating the new public pol uh, health policy in 2020, as Elsie has indicated. But I'll want us to narrow on a very, very uh, specific issue in terms of the institutional requirements, whether that policy is forward looking enough to anticipate the new possible pandemic that Dr. Enes Usu Dapa has indicated. Thank you very much. I think that uh, in short, it is forward looking. It is actually rooted in uh, the core strategy, our health sector strategy, that our quickest route to universal health coverage is through the CHIPS strategy. And therefore it focuses on a close to client service provision, leveraging on inf inf uh, key actors and institutions and having a coordinated approach to health within the context in which we have had this conversation, leveraging on both the clinical services, the public health services, and the socioeconomic aspect, which are determinants outside health. So in the last few years, there has been a much more committed engagement to a multi-sectorial approach. And I know at the center of government to be able to drive our healthcare agenda. So that is so. And so I've just said that. And also it has then focused on effective mobilization of local resources. And therefore key actors like development partners, the private sector, quasi governmental agencies, non-governmental organizations, community-based organizations and faith-based organizations and all those are integral parts. And you'll find that in our annual healthcare, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, events, we invite the NGOs in health as critical stakeholder at the table. And they are part of what we call, we have a very working uh, uh, arrangement. Maybe that spoke to the exemplary uh, leadership that this country has provided in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a health working group. And this is at the center of government at the level of the Ministry of Health, where there's an, a monthly meeting by all the critical stakeholders and then they plan the health needs and review the performance. So you find that it was easier for the emergency uh, uh, you know, uh, coordinate committee that was set up by His Excellency to be able to function. Yeah. In terms of moving forward, there are two things. What it became obvious is that the key issues we are talking about and worried about in this pandemic are ethical and professional in nature. So it is obvious that we need a national ethics or bioethics commission, which will look at issues of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of the context of an emergency like this. So that we do not leave that to institutional review boards and individual agencies without having a coordinated approach where you have people then take advantage and do a lot of things that are not supposed to be done in breach of the rights that we are fighting for. So, and this is something that we need. And also it became obvious that the difficult decisions that professionals and the healthcare professionals needed to make at the level of their institution, they did not have clinical or, or research or ethics committees at all. And therefore there was no basis. So now they were just going as, okay, let me do it this way. And so I think that from a regulatory point of view, we need more coordination at the level of healthcare professional regulators and the new policy provides that okay. and the medical and dental council is taking the, yes, the lead you, in that. We, we seem also to need out of time. final yeah. point just 
we need there are a number of allies that are pending for the Public Health Act, which will cover the non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, environmental conditions, the even the disposal of you know medical and other things like that. So I think that the key way forward here is to work with the Minister of Health to ensure that those legislative instruments are quickly passed to provide clarity and direction when another emergency hits. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Host, can you, do we have questions for the panelists live? A number of questions popped up, but seems to be gone again. Can the host help us whether some participants want to raise live questions for the panelists? Okay, we have from Emmanuel Young. How would you possibly position environmental health to address the right to health legally? That's one. That's from Albert Atabila. I think the question on whether or not a health staff can refuse to work in an unsafe work situation asked by, they still remains. It would be great to get further answers on that. And we have from Odando Beita, concerning COVID-19 especially, we have a law concerning mask wearing in public places. This law is not being enforced by the police. Can the IGP not be taken on and charged with endangering public safety? Can the medical professionals who are at the forefront of this pandemic not use the IGP, not sue the IGP for neglecting his duty and therefore putting them at greater risk? Yes, the panelists, each of you, you can take any one of it. Um, right. right, if I may come in. Um... And with respect to positioning environmental health to address the, the, the right to, uh, to health, environmental health is subsumed or is an integral part of what we call like the public health. So uh, ensuring that uh, we safeguard the environment from uh, pollution, release of toxic, uh, standard, uh, 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 toxic uh, substances in the environment and all that, which will inevitably come back to adversely impact on our health. Uh, is very much a part of the public health that we are talking about, except that because the focus on COVID-19, that is why most of the discussion here are, are focused on COVID-19, but public health is a very broad subject, very broad subject, and environmental health is very much part. If you look at the Public Health Act, you have a number of uh, uh, provisions uh, which are relevant in ensuring that we use the environment appropriately, so as not to let it uh, later on impact negatively on our health. Yeah, so that is what I would say with respect uh, to that. Now, the, working in the unsafe uh, situation, I think uh, later on we spoke uh, about that, that. Yes, for me, if you look at it, so long as an employer is, for example, not following national prescribed protocols uh, and probably PP if it's part of like the, the protocol for uh, containing the particular uh, 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 crisis, especially like the COVID-19 at the workplace. If it is not there, then legitimately, the employee can refuse to work because you'll be endangering yourself. But as I said, how law is, you always have to be careful. You need to complain first. And the complaint should not be by word of mouth. The complaint should be in writing to the employer, reminding the employer about the unsafe uh, condition, especially uh, his or her failure to put in place the requisite uh, protocols for you to be able to work. Once you do that, if you are ignored and repeat it, and you are ignored and refuse to go to work, if you are fired, if you go to court, I would like to submit that uh, you have a very good case. Yes. Yes. Can I, I, yes, yes. Can I also weigh in on the health workers point? I think that in looking forward as well, we need to do more to safeguard healthcare workers, but do it in a way that um, we don't encourage sort of a pat paternalistic um, system of healthcare such that only the doctor knows what's best, but also has regards for 
um, patient rights. So in doing more to safeguard healthcare workers, I would say that, for instance, uh, infection and prevention control policies, we need to, to make sure that in every facility that is, is well known, there's enough training about it, especially um, before or just in response to a health emergency. Then also we need to look at the compensation and benefits framework for healthcare workers when an emergency occurs and then liability protections because naturally they would be scared. Like Dr. Devine said, they are not saints. So they would have different concerns. So are there any liability protections for healthcare workers when an emergency hits? And then also we talked about, you know, allocation of scarce resources. How does that play out in, in, in terms of how the healthcare worker should be safeguarded? And then um, also guaranteeing that he's safe at home and in the community because it, it's happened in some places that um, doctors have been seen to be the ones spreading the disease in, in some countries. And so they've been um, victims of violence and whatnot. So I think that in the future, we should also look at ways in which um, healthcare workers can be safeguarded, not only in terms of PPE within the workplace, but then also looking broadly at other issues that affect healthcare workers. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, any other panelists or any other issue? Yes, I've just seen, yes, uh, just a quick one. I've seen um, Cletus Salenga, uh, who makes the point that executive instrument by their nature cannot create offenses. So if the minister declares, uh, you know, issues an executive instrument and people breach it, what remedies are, are there? I want to uh, indicate that there are already offenses provided for in the Public Health Act. And there are requirements for specific uh, legislative instruments, which are expected to also create further um, uh, offenses. So yes, there are processes and avenues available in the current Public Health Act, if we are so minded to ensure that uh, that situation is catered for. Um, in terms of uh, healthcare workers, I want to state it once again, that ours is an honorable, noble, traditional, and learned profession. And it is an essential service. Because of that, it means, essential means that it is available 24 seven. Justice in this country is not yet essential. The health is essential. So it means that even on your holiday, your public holiday, you do, it's not unusual to see us working. Now, there's a professional obligation ethically and professionally required that you have a professional obligation to treat people in emergency situations. We should not confound that with a legal duty of care or what the state's obligation or an employer's obligation to an employee is. So whilst we make the point and very forcefully as a professional regulator that our frontline professionals to be properly protected provided with adequate logistics, both for pay their patients and for themselves, and that there should be additional benefits to deal with the increased risks in which they find themselves. That is not sufficient to, to, to say that because I do not have enough. And I've already said, and uh, my brother added a third certainty, but I'm interested in two certainties, scarcity. There will always not be enough. And therefore you cannot make the point that because there's not enough, ammunition, then the soldiers disband. When actually their primary calling is that they are supposed to come and defend us. It's a very dangerous route. And I don't want to go into the ethical and the jurisprudential exploration of that. But simply put, doctors and physician assistants regulated by us know that professionally and ethically, they are obligated to treat in emergency situations. Yes, let me just let you add something a bit in relation to the issue of health and justice issues and the primacy to which you give health. What of the justice and equities of health? Where you would find out that the distribution of COVID resources yeah. across various geographical locations in Ghana cannot be said to be equitable. 
and to some extent might be discriminatory. And yet non-discrimination is one of the essential ingredients of the right to health. How do we deal with these equity and justice issues in this context? Absolutely on point, moderator. It is brilliant. And this is a major challenge to the healthcare system. There are inequities in access, geographical, economic, and quality of care. And then to make matters worse, there are inequities in macro and micro allocative decision-making processes. And one of the things that the new health sector policy affirms to, to address is to deal with these inequities in the healthcare system. For our part as a professional regulator, we have undertaken local policy initiatives, including now requiring to know specific distribution of specialists, general practitioners. In fact, if you go outside at a point, if you, we took the doctors in Greater Accra and Kumasi, the two regions, you dealt with 78% of all doctors in Ghana. Now, how can anybody who is making a macro decision, allocative decision, really go to sleep knowing that 14 other regions have only 22% of the healthcare, the leadership of the healthcare team that you are dealing with? So the new healthcare policy deals with those inequities, both in resource distribution, in logistic distribution, and in human resource distribution, both in the mix, skills mix, and in absolute numbers. Are we going to get over it in the tomorrow? I dare say no. But what we want is a political will not to interfere in those issues or in other words, from a bioethical perspective, to discriminate positively. That is why for me, when people say non-discrimination as a legal concept, I'll say, what do you mean? Because that is insufficient. In fact, the health system is set up to discriminate. And we are saying that the primary authors is to ensure that those more vulnerable are the first to be taken care of. That is the nature of the healthcare system. However, those who have more are given more. So I agree with you that we have a fundamental issue of resource allocation and Ernest touched on it earlier. And it is a major consideration for healthcare uh, you know, policy to move the processes forward. But we think that with the chief strategy and the sub-district arrangement and the district arrangement, if we work incrementally to locate, for example, you go and take a district, a loan of $30 million and build a district hospital. And you are happy as a policymaker to say that we have a general duty doctor there. A district of say 300,000 people. And out of the 300,000 people, you know that about 51.5 or 52% approximately are women. And you know that 70% of those women are in a reproductive age. And therefore you expect that a minimum of 10, maybe something like 10,000 or 20,000 pregnancies, and those are going to give you around 15,000 births. And you don't think that you should have a pediatrician. You don't think that you should have an, an obstetrician gynecologist. You don't think that you should have a general surgeon. You don't think that you should have an orthopedic surgeon. You don't think that we should have a, a dental surgeon or a psychiatrist. And yet we say we are moving to community psychiatric care. So you find a patient in Saboba who is running a mob and the nearest psychiatrist is in Kumasi not even in Tamale or Yendi. So those are serious issues. And if these inequities are left unaddressed uh, from a Catholic perspective, they become inequities. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think our time is almost due. Well, is there any other comment anybody wants to make before we bring proceedings to an end? Yes, um, I would like to touch on the mask issue that was raised by one of the questions that came up. Um, about the masks, the way the um, Imposition of Restrictions Act works is that even though the offense or in it, the, the punishment is created in the act, um, the offense or what the creation of the offense comes through the 
EI. So you have the banning of um, the making of not wearing mask and offense in an EI. And the EIs that flow from the IRA last for only three months unless they are extended by the president. So we had the mask um, EI coming out around um, is it May, April? So by this time, the three months has elapsed. So unless, and I don't know, I will have to find out, unless um, the president has extended that EI into 2021, then that, that's no, no longer a law. So nobody is breaking any law if they are not wearing the mask technically. So they are just appealing to our consciences to wear the mask and there's no legal backing to it as such. So that's, that's the answer I have for that question. Thank you very, very much panelists, particularly Dr. Eneso Wusu Dapa, who I have a paper for, you can see me off the program. <laughs> and uh, Elsie, for taking all the time of your cold weather in Liverpool to join us. Mami, you have given us a lot of the foundational and technical legal concepts. And my brother, Dr. Divine, has really opened the public minds to such a stimulate, to stimulating insights into the institutional and regulatory framework that we have in this country. Once again, thank you very much for coming on this third series. We definitely will be having a next panel in this series that would be addressing, will be assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And we're looking at the way forward. And this will be coming on on the 14th of January at the same time. So let's all stay tuned in and continue to follow this COVID series. I must say I have been enlightened greatly by the exposition and expertise. And I guess all participants have really been enlightened in relation to a very, very important but neglected area of legal discussions. I hope that this series and particularly this session will kindle a lot of intellectual and cross-disciplinary interest in looking at the right to health in the context of public health and particularly within the context of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being a wonderful moderator. We mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Fantastic.